Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of A Naked Conversation With. Today, we are with an author, an artist, someone that is creating content around naturism. And I think that the work that you're doing, Will, is wonderful. Will Forrest, for you guys, has written several books that is um, from naturist fiction, and he's also part of a group of naturist authors. And we're going to be hearing about this, all about this, uh, during this conversation. First of all, Will, thank you for joining this conversation. Thank you for accepting the invitation. How are you doing today? How are things at home? And how are things in your country? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Hector, for inviting me. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. Thank you for all the hard work that you are doing for, for naturism in your country and around the world. Um, I'm gonna, your question about what's going on in my country right now, I'm just gonna say no comment. Um, <laughs> I don't blame you. You know, it's a nice day, kind of sunny outside. That's about all I can say. How's the weather? Yeah, exactly. Right. It's, it's sunny. Isn't that great? That's, that is great. Um, right here, it, it's pretty, I mean, it's pretty chilly for Mexican standards, for Guadalajara standards. Our weather is very crazy because it's, it's the type of weather that it's colder inside than it is outside. And when, yeah. when you're in the shade, you get cold and you want, you want to wear a jacket. But when you go to the sun, you start sweating and you feel like the sun is burning. So it's, it's pretty um, not naturist friendly right now. Yeah. That's why, well, in part, that's why I'm dressed with a sweater. But also, I explained this in the beginning of all the conversations that I am making this podcast video podcast stress because I want this to be shareable on all the platforms. And since we all know and are very well aware that our community is constantly censored, I'd like this information to get out there because I feel like in this case, the information from the people that I'm talking with is more important than actually being naked to talk about naturism. So, well, tell us a little bit about, um, first of all, where people can find your work. I, I do follow you on Twitter as Nude Scribe. You guys can find this link in the description of the video if you guys see this video on YouTube. And if when I tweet, I'm gonna also include that so you guys could find the work. But I see you also have your personal website, nudescribe.com. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, thanks for asking. So. Um, Newscribe.com is something that I started about 10 years ago when I decided that I was ready to publish my first novel. And um, so there are my two novels. You can see them there on the screen. Two novels, you wow. Them. You can find these on Amazon and any other place you would, you would buy books. Um, you can also get to them from, from my site or from my Twitter page. And um, the idea was that uh, the, the, the novel that I wrote, the first one is called Coed Naked Philosophy. And it, it was based on some things that happened to me in real life. Um, one, one Monday morning, I received a cold call and someone asked me to do a striptease at a bachelorette party. Wow. <laughs> it was like, that doesn't happen every day. Interesting conversation. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, I thought about it, but ultimately I did not do that. But um, around the same time, my family and I had gone to um, a nude beach in the Florida Panhandle, and I was just, and we had a great time. And I was struck by this kind of um, contrast between natural, healthy nudity versus the sexualized nudity of the striptease. And so, partly to explore how I thought about it, I started writing. And how I, old were you? I would have been about, let's see, 30. 30? Okay. So you were already in, in a mature age. I mean, if you would have discovered this maybe about, you know, 15 or 18, you're still um, creating a view of the world of, of life. So I think by 30, you, you pretty much know yourself very well. Right. So, so yeah. So like when we went to the nude beach, it was, like I said, it was a, this was actually an unofficial nude beach in the Florida panhandle. And, um, there was a danger, I think, of being arrested for trespassing. I don't remember exactly what, but but no, it was it was full of people, 
And I mean, there were all kinds of people, sizes, shapes, colors, ages, everything. And it was a great afternoon. And so, um, yeah, to kind of like think about what that meant and how to process that kind of thing, I started writing and it, it, you know, gradually over probably about 10 years turned into a novel. And I wanted to do, you know, what any writer wants to do with a novel, which is get it published with a New York publisher, you know, get an agent, all that kind of stuff. But that didn't happen because I think for a lot of reasons, um, it's a very niche kind of thing. So I decided to take advantage of growing opportunities to self-publish. And um, that's how I did that. And so, and so when you do that, you have to be your own marketing team. So I started the, the web page and the Twitter account. And, you know, it's, it's really been cool. It's, it has been 10 years now, I think about it. And, and the amount of naturist writers out there has just grown and grown and we've become a community, like you were saying before. Mm-hmm. It's an international community. And, you know, I guess there used to be a bad reputation that if someone found a novel that had anything to do with nudity, it would be some erotic novel. But, you know, now, not, it's not that those novels don't exist, they still do. <laughs> But there are plenty of examples out there of what we call naturist fiction, which is, you know, fiction, it might be science fiction, it might be historical fiction, it might be a mystery, a thriller, mm-hmm. but it has some kind of element where the characters, you know, are either already naturist or there are characters who learn about what naturism is. And in some way, you know, it has to do with the plot. So, so let's go back a little bit um, yeah. to your first experience and how that transformed the way that you viewed your body and other people's body. And also you mentioned that you made a comparison between eroticized nudity and non-eroticized nudity. Let's go back to that a little bit. So you, you mentioned that your first experience was going to an unofficial nude beach. How was that experience? Like, how did you feel before, like, first of all, how did you discover it? And then how did you feel before you arrived when you took off your clothes and then after being there for a while? I wish I remembered how I discovered it. I, I think I heard some, we were on a beach um, and it was a, you know. What beach was this? I want to say. And when you say we, who, who was we? Okay, so, so this was, this was uh, my wife and myself and our, and our older daughter who at the time was our only daughter, she was about three or four. Okay. And we were at this beach, I'm not remembering which one it was, but it was uh, like a, you know, a normal beach where people have to wear swimsuits. And maybe I heard someone say something, or I don't know how I found out about this, but I, I was like, hey, let's go check this out. Because you had to walk further down the beach, like past a, a barrier, right? Mm-hmm. Get to the nude part. And I'm like, I, yeah, I wonder, you know, it's kind of like a dare. I dared my wife, she dared me, we kind of both went together. And, and um, like I say, when we got there, it was, it was, I'm trying to remember, I think it was actually, cause it was a smaller space. I think it was fuller. It was more, there were more people on that beach. On the and, nude side? On the nude side. Well, and maybe, like I say, maybe it was cause it was such a smaller space, but it, there were plenty of people. And like I say, all sizes, shapes, colors, and ages and everything else. And, and, you know, we, we, decided to take off our clothes, our swimsuits. Um, some of the three of us quickly- Who struggled did. with it the most. <laughs> well, that would have been my wife, um, but she did come around and, and, you know, so we spent a couple of hours there and and then went back to the other side. And, and it's also interesting that you said that you were with your, your, with your child back then. I think it was your only child back then. How, how was that experience? I mean, normally, when people try these things or experiment, they tend to go either by themselves or with the couples, but you you went all out and said, it's now or never. I mean, yeah, she she was, uh, like I say, three or four. I, I think, you know, toddlers don't care so much, right? No. They actually love being naked, yeah. as far yeah. as I've noticed. Yeah, exactly. It's hard to get them to put their clothes on. <laughs> yeah, I don't think she had any problem at all. Um, but yeah, so that that was. Um, I mean, I think I had I had heard of like nudism, right, or places that you can go to. To did you have any preconception of what naturism was, or, I mean, you knew there was a nudity aspect, but did you know anything more about it? Um, I did not. Only that it was like you know penalized, right? 
there were legal, there could be legal consequences. That's, that was all I knew. Was there a risk factor in, in your motivation to do it? <laughs> was it like maybe the idea of possibly getting arrested? Did that sound exciting? No, the, the possibly getting arrested, I only discovered afterwards because that okay. day <clears throat> after we left, I started, you know, doing some research. Wait, what was this place, right? And it turned out it was some kind of a military base or something. And then every once in a while, they would, you know, send out MPs, military police, and do like a kind of a little raid on those crazy nudists. Um, we didn't see that happen. We didn't, you know, that was, it was not that That's strange. All. And that, that marks a difference between Mexico and, and the U.S. Um, in Mexico, I mean, the Marines could, could arrive and tell you to leave but they can't really do anything about you being naked because there's nothing under the federal law that prohibits nudity or even indecency or things like that. Generally, those type of uh, laws or rules are in a municipal level or in a state level. But the interesting thing is that the, the beach from where the water starts to 10 meters to the land um, is considered to be federal property and everything that is federal property is under federal law. And since there's nothing under federal law that says that it's prohibited, then you can't really get arrested for it. Yeah, it is a marked difference between Mexico and the US that what you're saying about the federal, the beach is the property of the, of the Mexican people, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a big, big difference. That's not the case in the States. It's not the case in the States. And I think that, you know, the idea was that um, we could have been prosecuted for trespassing, but we also could have been prosecuted for public nudity. I think that's, that was the case. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's maybe like Al Capone. They it could never prove that he was doing anything illegal, but he wasn't paying taxes. So they don't get you one way, they could get you another one, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so you discovered that it was um, trespassing, but how was the experience? Like, um, did anything change in the way that you perceived your body or your wife perceived her body after that? Um, not for me. I think that I can't really speak for my wife. I wouldn't want to you know, put thoughts from her head, but I think that it was important for her in the sense of having that kind of experience. Um, because years later, you know, fast forward, um, there came a point where I was much more active in naturism and was wanting to bring my family in. And she was, <laughs> She was a bit resistant, but you know, we remembered that day on the beach and that kind of thing. And so, yeah, it, it, it definitely opened some doors in her thinking about it. So something continued in, in you that wanted you to continue to take part in naturism, as you mentioned. Um, how was your first involvement in naturism after this beach experience? Did you go to clubs or how did you get involved? Shortly after that, a couple of years after that, um, I moved to a different job in a different state and um, found a, a park uh, close by to where I live now. And um, started going um, because to their credit, um, they didn't have any kind of um, restriction about single males. You know, so many parks do that. Um, I was going for the first time I went as a single male, I think maybe the second time and to kind of get to know the place and see what it was like. And um, it's it's a beautiful, wonderful, it's actually the second largest park in the United States. Uh, What's the name of the park? Oak Lake Trails. And, and that's where you're currently a member as well, right? You've remained in this park. That's right. And they, you know, they, they do a great job of providing opportunities um, for outdoor uh, recreation because the, the park is, like I say, it's huge. It's got miles and miles and miles of trails uh, through the woods. Most of the park is undeveloped. It's, you know, forest. And, um, but anyway, so you asked if I, how I got more involved, if I got more involved. Yes, that's what happened because over the years, I met more people out there and became more active in helping plan programming. I helped someone who lives there set up the first arts festival and we've had an arts festival every year since. And over the past couple of years, I've become more involved in programming with them and, um, and also their social media. So yeah, it's, it's, it's helpful, you know, to have that on the ground experience. Did you ever feel discriminated as a single male? Well, I mean, it might be harder for you because 
you've remained in the same park that was welcoming from the beginning. But before your family was involved, did you ever perceive any discrimination um, as a single male? No. No? Nope. That's good. I mean, I've, I've heard horror stories of parks that kick a member out after he lost his wife or something like that. So, right. Yeah. Um, so tell us a little bit about your professional background. I see that you're involved in a lot of arts and you said something about programming and, and did you say programming or was yeah. it social media and, and that? Yeah. Right. So I'm a teacher and, um, the, I don't, um, <laughs> Wait, what was the question? What what uh, what is my background? Your so, professional background, yeah. Right. So uh, so I'm involved in um, teaching literature and writing. Writing and reading are you know kind of part of my job, and so I wanted to um, to take that into my my own wheelhouse, so to speak. And so when I when I wrote the first novel, Go Ahead Naked Philosophy, there are some scenes that take place on that same beach that I was describing for you. Mm -hmm. In the novel, you know. Sure, the police show up, people get arrested. <laughs> um, it's more it's more dramatic because you know obviously you need that kind of conflict in the novel. But the novel is about a teacher who decides to he has some circumstances where his he's a philosophy teacher and mm -hmm. his department his department is under the axe because you know state governments spending humanities, we don't want these humanities people. And so the, his department is in danger of being eliminated, but he decides to do something radical, which is to offer a course on the aesthetics of the human body and offer it as a naked course. And people are, you know, skeptical. Of course, this, you know, this, unfortunately, this probably would not happen in reality, but um, they allowed him to do it. And, you know, it turns into a hit. There, there's tons of students who want to take the course, right? Because they, mm -hmm. it's, like, it's a cool course. And plus they, they discover how cool social nudism is. And so they start their own group and they get the community involved. And that's, that's basically what happens in that, in that novel. But it was, it was based on these experiences that I had at that time. How does the creation process work? I'm not very familiar with authors that write books. So how, like, how, how do you come from an idea or an inspiration and I don't know, maybe like design a plot and, and a story and like, how does, how does that process work? Is it something that, you know, comes to you or is there like a mythology that you follow or? Yeah, I mean, people have different methods, right? Um, some people are very uh, organized and they, they set out an, an, an outline and they write backstories for every character uh, and all this stuff. Um, I'm usually more of someone who tries to go with it organically. Mm -hmm. When I'm inspired to write a scene, I'll sit down and write it, even though I don't know quite where it's going to go yet, you know? Yeah, because there's this idea sometimes that, oh, a writer just sits down and writes the novel from, from word one to, to the last word. And that's just, that's how it works. It doesn't, it doesn't really work that way. So you're, at least for me, you're writing little pieces here and there, and then you have to go back and string them all together into a whole. And as you're writing the pieces, you get an idea for the plot and like <clears throat> what's going to happen and what the different character trajectories are going to be. And so usually, it, you know, it works out. And do you get inspiration from other sources, like other novels or other maybe movies or, or series or something um, to, to come up with, like how the plot is going to evolve? Or is it like based on personal experience or where do you where do you get that? That's a great question. Absolutely. I mean, you know, it, um, other other novels and, and movies, um, TV shows and series are terrific inspiration. And so like the second novel that I wrote, which is called The Glow, is kind of like, I was kind of inspired to write something along the lines of a thriller or kind of a Da Vinci Code type book, where there are different clues and, and you know, the protagonists are finding clues that have to do with the past. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to set it in Mexico and in Brazil, I wanted to set it in the ancient Americas. And it has to do with how, how the, um, the native peoples of the Americas might have had a particular kind of knowledge mm -hmm. about being naked in the landscape that we no longer have or that we lost right when so, when the spanish and the Brit and the portuguese arrived were the natives naked 
depends on which part of the of the country, right? So like, or which part of the continent. I mean, <laughs> the Brazilians fam- or the, the Portuguese famously when they got to what is now Brazil, right, were, were just astounded because everyone was naked. And that's of course in the tropics right there along the coast. But you know, in, in Mexico, for example, <clears throat> the Mayans and the Aztecs didn't run around without clothes. They had very strict, in fact, uh, clothing like expectations. Wow. If you were an Aztec warrior, you could only wear a certain type of sandal. If you had captured if you had captured one enemy combatant, if you had captured two enemies then you had the right to a certain kind of cloak or whatever, you know, it was all very regimented. So, but they didn't have the same obsession with uh, hiding the genitals that we did, that we do, right? Like, you know, it's, it's weird. I mean, the, the Aztecs, for example, would make fun of the Purepecha or the Tarasco mm-hmm. people because they would say that they had no shame and they would, you know, not hide their genitals or they would make fun of the Huastecos who lived in what is now Veracruz and, and, and what else, uh, Hidalgo, because they would say that they would run around naked. In fact, the word Huasteco means naked in, in Nahuatl. Huasteco? Okay, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, and so, so they, were, they, they had their own sense of like shame and what was appropriate and what wasn't. But, and this is, this is what you guys are doing in Mexico that's so cool, it's the Temascales. I mean, the Temascal was, you know, a huge social nudism kind of, outlet you know at the time and that's it's so cool to see how you guys have have like been able to have the mascal events now as as nature is all over the country yeah and for those of the of you who are unfamiliar with the demascal demascal is a mesoamerican steam bath that is very linked to a ritual there's a pretty big ritual aspect and um Maybe you know more about this if the original ones were completely nude, but I discovered naturism um, through the World Naked Bike Ride, but I started practicing it through a demascal that was clothing optional, where most of the people would participate fully nude, because especially during the demascal ritual and when you're inside, everything gets very wet and sticky, and and there's a lot of different herbs and, and things involved, and doing it with clothing on, you probably will ruin the clothing that you use. So it's not, it's not a good experience when you're dressed. Um, were the original Temascales nude? I mean, as far as we know, right? Or, or it, it's someone, it's kind of like going to a sauna today, right? Some people are just comfortable with sitting on their towel and not wearing anything. Other people want to keep their towel wrapped around them. I think that there may have been some people who for whatever reason wanted to keep on their little loincloth you know, at the time, but other people would have been comfortable removing it. Yeah, and it's really interesting how, you know, several hundreds years later, it's a tradition that is still alive and active. This is actually, um, it really, I, I think the person who ran the Temascala has made a very clever link between um, doing something clothing optional or nude and this this ritual and we've also been to different demascales to different parts of mexico and different events and they all have like their uniqueness so it's not it's not like a standard um steam bath there's there's different aspects about it and i wish i knew more to explain to the people but each element has like a representation right um which is very interesting if, if people have the opportunity to come to Mexico to a clothing optional activity, I would highly suggest if it's a possibility to try out the Temascal. Have you participated in any Temascales? I have not had the chance to participate in a Temascal yet. And, and I learned from you about, I think one that is in Michoacan that is the first uh, solar Temascal, is that right? It's- well, um, I'm not sure if I'd call it necessarily a temascal. The owner of, of the place uh, definitely called it a temascal. The experience was very different, but it's it's basically like a pyramid that was constructed from, uh, I'm not sure if it's plastic or glass or something, but with the sun and the way that it's designed, it creates a lot of heat inside. Look at greenhouse. Yeah. yeah. So, so when you go in, you feel just like you're 
inside of Temascal when the temperature gets pretty high around there, like around two, three in the afternoon. And that part of Michoacan is very warm. There's a very nice, warm, humid climate. So it gets really, really hot, but we didn't really participate in like the ritual of the Temascal. That's why I'm not saying it's not a Temascal. It's just that the way that we experienced it was just going into a, a really hot room. That's a big difference, you're right. The ritual is, is very important and it's cool how the ritual is going to continue too. I think another big difference though, right, would be that a, a Temascal normally it's dark in there. Whereas, whereas this one would be just like full of light, right? Yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, I, I would recommend to go in with glasses because with sunglasses because it, it does get pretty bright inside. Um, so tell us a little bit about your inclination, or at least I've perceived in our interactions an inclination towards um, Mexican Brazilian culture and, and history. Where does that interest come from? Um, that's a great question. So I, I, um, I've always been really good at languages and I, you know, I, I, uh, my profession involves teaching literature in Spanish and in Portuguese. And um, so, and I married into a Mexican family. So um, I have a Mexican American family and, you know, I've traveled a lot in Mexico. I've had the opportunity to travel in Brazil as well. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm just, it, it's fascinating to me, the, um, <clears throat> the range of culture in Latin America, of cultures. Um, it, it's particularly the period of, of the European contact and all of the ramifications that came from that uh, is fascinating and how it, how it affects culture to this day. Um, but yeah, so, you know, being someone who is also interested in naturism, I've always been interested in seeing what what is that? What does it mean to be a naturist in Mexico or in Brazil, you know? And particularly in the case of Mexico, you know, I remember one time when I was visiting, it's been a long time ago, and I saw a sign that said, Tienda Naturista. And I was like, oh, wow, it's a nature store. Of course, you know. Yeah. It, nothing to do with that at all. Yeah. Tienda Naturista means like health foods and natural remedies and this kind of thing, right? Yeah. It's more like... Um herb-based soaps and things like that. Yeah, it's, it's funny because that's that's the reason why we prefer the word nudist versus naturist, because if you if you say naturista, which is naturist in Spanish, people are going to think that you sell herb lore or things like that. Um, exactly, yeah. Yeah, so it was a big letdown because, because there, there are lots of tiendas naturistas. And I was oh, yeah. like, oh, Wow, there's a lot of nature support. No, of course not. That's not. <laughs> yeah, that, that's true. Um, when talking about the the comparisons between Brazilian naturism and, and Mexican naturism, I think Brazilians have been at it for quite a while. They have very strong, large institutions. They have managed to get a lot of official, new designated beaches and, and places like that. So. Um, I think Mexico has felt inspiration and, and learned, and, and we've also had coordination with, with Brazilian, but I also have never had the experience of going to Brazil and comparing naturism. Have you had a, a naturist experiences in Brazil and in Mexico, and have you noticed any differences? I have had naturist experiences in both countries. Um, and you're right, I mean, in Brazil, they're, they They've been at it for decades. Um, they like to talk about a precursor who was, um, she was an actress and um, her name was Dora Vivacqua, but she went by her stage name, which it's confusing because of course in Brazil they speak Portuguese, but her stage name is in Spanish. It's Luz del Fuego. And she, um, she was kind of a, as I say, an actress, but she was also an activist. And she was basically the founder of being able to think about um, naturism as an organized activity in Brazil. She, in fact, she wrote a book, like a treatise called A Verdade Nua, The Naked Truth. And it had to do with this idea that we should respect our bodies, the body is sacred, the body is not shameful. And not only that, but she managed to purchase an island in uh, Guanabara Bay, right there in Rio de Janeiro. Wow. And she, 
she set up her own little kind of nudist retreat where she would have, you know, visitors and some of the more famous people of the time. We're talking the 1950s, I think. So yeah, her her example led to a lot of um, what you're talking about, kind of um, designating beaches officially, um, setting up clubs, and and yeah. So there's a bit there's a bit more of a storied history there in Brazil, and I always wondered. Yeah, what's going on in Mexico? Where where are the Mexican you know natures? And and fortunately, you came along, and also uh, the Federación, and you guys have been doing you know terrific, outstanding work, not only for Mexico but showing the whole world how to do it. You know. Yeah, well, in Mexico, I feel like I mean we've had Cipolita since the seventies, where people would go you know skinny dipping, uh, but it wasn't really something that was widely known or, or widely popular. I feel that organized naturism was born with Yahoo groups. There was a Yahoo group called Nudemex, where you know people would go online and ask questions. And as time went on, I think this group lasted you know several years, it was very active. They started organizing activities and things like that. But everything exploded when Spencer Tunick had this massive event in Mexico City in, in El Zócalo. I think there was about 15,000 people or more. I don't know. It was just a massive event. It's probably one of the largest Spencer Tunic uh, events that have taken place in the world. So a lot of people that started in, in organized naturism started from there on because before that, they thought that no one was interested. But evidently, since this event was so successful, there was a lot of interest. So that's like when organized naturism takes place. And then, but it was very underground. I think the naturism, I mean, Spencer Tunick was in 2007. Uh, the Federation was born in 2010, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then from there on, it's just, it's been, it was first, people were hesitant to go out in the open because fear of being considered perverts or losing their jobs or, you know, having problems with their family. But then as time has gone on, it's been more and more open. And I think at least the, the part that I have contributed to it is being more open. When, when I discovered naturism, it was very underground, very difficult, very, you had to know someone who was part of it in order to become part of it. Right. And then as I started getting more and more involved. That's what, that was my goal to make it more accessible. So we started posting events online on Facebook and we started, you know, creating ways to integrate people that wasn't necessarily someone that was invited by someone else and so on. So um, from there on, it's been more and more open. And I think that's, that's the point where a lot of people started discovering naturism in Mexico, but I'm um, nowhere near the first generations. The first generations have been at it for decades. It's just they were doing it, you know, hidden behind closed curtains or doors, right. which is also something that has happened in, in, in the States, right? That for, for many years, naturism has been a behind closed doors activity. Um, I mean, you do, you do have public beaches and, and things like that but it's it's always been like these big closed organizations like anner and then other organizations that are more open like the nature society or free free beach association and so on so we're we're still years away from anything like that yeah it's interesting you mentioned that because it's true in the u.s we have this weird situation where we've got these two big national organizations and 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 there is very much about clubs and the nature society is very much about public access to, to nude use on public lands, right? And so Anner is by far the bigger organization and the more conservative one because they are basically business owners. You know, yeah. they, they have to make their, keep their parks going and keep their memberships going and all that kind of stuff. Whereas TNS is more about the philosophy of naturism and, and getting people out to experience being free in nature on public lands, right? What do you think about the strategy that Andrew has been implementing these years, I feel like there's there's a conflict with having a closed, more business chamber, or I don't know if that's the correct way to say it, 
versus the movements of naturism in the states that have been making it more inclusive, more open, more diverse, less white, and so on. Well, that's, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. That's a real point of tension right now. I don't necessarily mean conflict, but I definitely mean tension in the sense that Inner and, and the parks are having to decide what they're going to do about that, you know, how to, how to accommodate changing demographics, because a lot of them, the parks have been around quite a while, founded by people of, of a different generation. And when you look at what's happening on Twitter, for example, um, and you see, you know, young naturists who are much more interested in just about anything except being a club member, Mm -hmm. um, then, you know, they have, to, they have to figure out how to reconcile that. One of the things that I've been active in at the, the park that I mentioned, Oak Lake Trails with a friend of mine, uh, a very close friend of mine, is helping them kind of think of ways to get more people involved. Because it's, it's one thing to kind of sit back and say, well, you know, we're open for, for anybody. Anyone can come. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and another thing to actually try to find those people and make them feel welcome, you know? Yeah. And so we're, we're looking at ways of hosting different kinds of special days, uh, Women's Day, this kind of thing, um, uh, or just you know, working with the, the network of people who already go to the park to make sure that other people feel more welcome. But yeah, that's, it, is, it, is a, it is a tension that has, I think it's existed just about as long as organized naturism has been around, right? The, between the older generation and the younger generations. But now with the internet, um, it's, it's just, it's a new thing, you know, it's a different face. Why do you think there's such a huge uh, generation, I would say, well, I'm not sure if the right word would be discrepancy, but at, I mean, I, I, I know that most naturists that are around, that are leaders, owners of clubs, that were board members, probably started around the 70s and they've been at it since. But at, at one point in time, people start, like younger people stopped getting involved. So there's like a huge gap of, you know, age differences. And I feel that now there's a lot of young people, or at least I've noticed a lot of young people that are interested in promoting naturism, it has different elements than, than the ones from the traditional ones, because I think we're more influenced by more modern ideas, or I wouldn't say modern because they're new, because I mean, I think everything is recycled, but it's maybe what's trendy now. And we've incorporated this what happened to naturism or why did they fail to have continuity when it comes to generations? That, that's a great question. I, I think it, it, going back a bit to what you said about um, the, 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 um, the, the 70s, right? I mean, how much, how much has technology changed since the 70s? Now there's hashtags, now there's you know, instant video of something happening. You know, you you could practically give a master class. You you and your your colleagues who were running an NG, and then the Federación, you know, have been very adept at using social media. And I think that for the the folks who have been hanging on since the 70s, as you say, um, it's just it's such a learning curve to figure out how to do that. Because on the one hand, we want people to feel welcome. We don't want them to feel like they're going to be filmed if they don't want to be filmed or photographed if they don't want to be photographed. On the other hand, being able to film and photograph shows how wholesome naturism is and how fun it is and how healthy it is. And I think that, you know, they're still trying to figure that out, how to balance those issues. I think it's easier when you're starting out, like that's that's the main difference that I see from naturism in Mexico versus naturism in other countries that have been at it for so long. There's already an established culture. So trying to change things is very difficult because you have a large community that resists some of these changes. And the advantage that we had is that no one knew anything different. So anything we decided to implement became part of the culture. And if you accustom people to doing this, um, 
it becomes normal. And that's, that's kind of the experience that we had. We were disruptive when we started promoting naturism and organizing it because there was a long tradition of how things were done uh, that people wanted to keep. It was very informal. It was very like, there was no such thing as community standards. There was no such thing as a process that people would have to follow in order to participate. Like all these things were radical, were radical ideas, but I think they were necessary if we wanted to have a quick expansion of the community. And what we started doing was first asking people if they wanted to participate in pictures, uh, turning their backs to the camera. Right. And then at first, no one wanted to do it, but then a couple people did and then so on. And then eventually we asked, you know, if you want to turn around, you can turn around. If you want to stay turned looking in the back do that. And then we had, it came to a point where we had enough people that wanted to be full frontal that we only started doing those. And then we moved on to video and so on. So all the people that participate in our community have always been accustomed to a camera. They don't all want to participate, but that's why we have a culture of asking people from the beginning if they want to participate in videos or, or pictures or whatever. If they choose not to, it's something that we never insist, we never pressure, we never try to get them to. So they understand that if they don't want to do it, they don't, they don't have to. Um, but they don't feel uncomfortable when I'm walking around with a camera taking pictures or video or things like that because we have a way to distinguish them. We, we give them a specific color wristband. Yeah. Um, yeah, lots of places have been using that kind of idea and, and, and it works. It does. I think, but again, there's this, there's this generation that was accustomed to, you know, oh, uh, we only use first names, you know, he, here in our little group, we, because we don't want people to have to risk uh, getting found out because it might destroy their job or their yeah. church membership or whatever. And so there was this kind of just, you know, anonymity that was cultivated. Whereas you, you, <laughs> you can't do that at all if you're filming and you're, and you're taking these photographs. You guys have done some wonderful photographs, like, the, you know, having people stand at particular places in the landscape. I remember one where you guys were at some place that you rented, I think. And as you say, everyone is facing back. It's facing backwards, except you. You're the only person looking forward. And then, then as you say, you went on to get more people, you know, to, to that that were comfortable facing the camera, and it, it, it's. I, I mean, I hope that continue to grow. That's what needs to continue to happen, right? Like the well, hashtag. I, I want to take it one step further, and this is something that I've never, I haven't mentioned publicly until now, but I've been thinking for a very long time to start hitting the streets. Um, it's still an idea. It's working. It's going to take a, a while. Because if we do it, I want to do it. I want it to be done in a certain way that it can be replicated. So I don't want to do anything dumb. Um, but I think if we want to, to be normalized as a community, we need to go out. We need to stop hiding. And people still don't know that we exist because social media is constantly making sure that we're kept as a underground community. Because, I mean, we've, we've tried to be on every platform there is and tried to share our lifestyle, but sooner or later we get shut down. Right, right now we're, we're on Twitter because Twitter allows nudity, but who knows if that's going to last or not. But something that I feel that they can't control has to do more with with news outlets and things like that. Um, I don't know, like having people write articles about who we are and what we do and, and what we stand for. And then ha having people know that maybe once a year there's this manifestation or, I don't, I don't know, I get confused with the word protest and manifestation. Um, right. Yeah, uh, I think like like a like a public gathering. I think you mean like a yeah. street gathering. Yeah, like uh, like going out and and making ourselves visible. Yeah. Um, I think that's the next step. And and if that's something that can be replicated internationally, I think that will definitely help. I mean, the way that I've seen naturism from the beginning is this is a trend, and this trend will continue. And whether we 
decide to push that trend or not doesn't mean that it's not going to happen. The only thing that's going to be different is who is going to do it and maybe with what um, agenda. Mm -hmm. So I feel that this is something that we as a community should be ahead. There's been so many examples of like whenever Instagram changed their policy when it came to nudity, I think it was because of the artistic movement of Spencer Tunick. And then there was also uh, censorship of mothers that were breastfeeding and so on. It's like, where's the naturist community? The naturist community should be beside these movements working together in order for social media to understand who we are and what we stand for. And it, you know, it hasn't been the case. We right. have, I, I would say a huge crisis of institutionalized naturism. Yeah, uh, probably more so here than where you are. But yes, uh, there was a lot of outcry last year, for example, that you know, where were, where were the naturist organizations when the Black Lives Matter uh, movement was, was at its peak? Um, folks were remembering um, Lee Baxendahl, who was the, the person who founded the Nature Society and how he went out of his way to make sure everyone that felt uh, welcome. And, you know, there, there was, I think, some acknowledgement on the level of the organized naturist groups, but it was very, very late and very, very a small. Uh, it's not the way we would want naturism to lead, you know? And I think in certain places they have problems with confederate flags and things like that um my as i mentioned before when i went to florida i went to several nude clubs that had the confederate flag it would well i wouldn't say the clubs had it more like the residents some residents at, at the clubs had it i didn't really understand what it was i knew that it was it had you know racial implications or something i i was explained that it was more of a heritage thing. But I think with the events that have been taking place in the States, I'm more and more inclined to think that it's more of a white supremacist symbol than it is yeah. you know, heritage. And if we, if we remember the war, the civil war in the States, it was about slavery. So, you know, it's right now, I mean, when it comes to the States and politics, I think everything is very politicized right? and naturism is no exception. Naturism is no exception. And, and if you're a young person and maybe you're a person of color and you go to a naturist park and there are folks who live there and it's their own property and their own house and their own address and everything. And they've got a Confederate flag, let's say, you know, you're, you're not really going to feel welcome. And, and, you know, does so-and-so have a right to put out a Confederate flag on their property? Well, sure legally they do but it's not it's not helping attract people into naturism it's not helping people feel welcome at a naturist park right well and, I, I do have to be honest I, I never felt discriminated or you know treated differently um at all in all the places where I went everyone was super friendly and I felt like they were especially friendly because I was young <laughs> They don't, they're not used to seeing a lot of young people around. So I, I, I never felt, I mean, I can't say I felt unwelcome. I was surprised when I saw it because I didn't know what it was, but I knew that there was, you know, there's conflict around it, but it's just, it, it's really difficult. I mean, I, I, I try not to talk about politics when it comes to the States, because first of all, it's not of my business. I'm, I'm not, um, I'm not a citizen. I don't live in the country. I'm not directly affected by anything that takes place. And I feel that, you know, a mistake that the U.S. has made is to get involved in other people's politics. You think? A big mistake. And I mean, I don't want to sound, I don't, I don't want people to feel bad about what my opinion is, but some of the events that are taking place in the States right now are events that have been provoked by the states in other countries yes yeah and you know it's it's scary it's scary to see things like that happen um i just hope that the country gets over it yeah well me too
you know, there's all kinds of memes and comments along the lines of what you're saying, right? About you know who's the banana republic now and this kind of thing. Um, yeah, it's a it's a really unfortunate turn of events. But back to what you were saying about what you want to organize. Are, are you thinking kind of like, if I if I'm understanding you correctly, it would be like a world naked bike ride, but without the bike ride. It would be it would, people it out in the streets. A world naked walk. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that, right? But that I mean, I, I'd like it. I mean, I, I want I wanted to be a walk involved. But I also want it to be very associated with cultural, educational. Um, I don't want it to be only a recreational activity. I want it to have a lot of substance. I want it to be an opportunity to educate society. And I also feel that in order for it to work, we, we have to team up with other social movements, um, you know, with diversity community, LGBT, feminism, um, that's the way I see it, but I, I do imagine just having like nature centered um, public displays would be, or yeah, public display, yeah. I don't know if like a festival would be correct or what terminology would be when it, when it has a strong educational and cultural and artistic influence behind it. I don't know. Yeah, if I think of the word later, I'll send it to you, but but I, I like what you're saying. It sounds like a really cool idea. I've, I've always thought, I mean, for years now I've thought that one of the ways forward for naturism is to be much more involved with health because it is a healthy thing. It's mm -hmm. healthy physically, it's healthy mentally, it's healthy emotionally. And if, if people could understand that, it would be like, you know, have you, have, you, um, have you taken your vitamin C? Are you getting enough exercise? Are you getting enough sun? You know, those are the questions that you ask someone that you care about you care about their health, right? And and frankly, the opportunity to go swimming without wearing a swimsuit, the opportunity to go hiking without wearing any clothes, those are about health, you know. Yeah. I wonder. I wonder to what extent we can we can push the. You know, you mentioned arts, you mentioned um, diversity, etc., and those are great too. And I, and I just I just continue to think that health should be part of. It. Yeah, I mean, um. I'm a little bit hesitant when it comes to health because I don't know, it, it's like a, a dilemma that I have uh, on one, on one spectrum. I feel that everybody is perfect. And I feel that, you know, we shouldn't shame people by their physical appearance. It doesn't matter if they're big or small or whatever. And on the other side, I feel that, you know, naturism has a health element to it. So how do we promote a healthy lifestyle that doesn't body shame, that doesn't promote unrealistic beauty standards and things like that? And, and then there's another, like a third dilemma that if people decide to modify their body to meet certain aesthetics, I feel that, that they're entirely in the right to do so. I don't think that there should be anything wrong with doing it. It's just that I feel that as a community, we should empower people to accept themselves the way they are. So I don't know where I stand in, in all of this. Um, what do you I think? You're saying, and, and, and this is interesting because I wasn't thinking of it that way at all. I was thinking, I think what you're saying is kind of more what I would call fitness. Yeah. But what I was focusing on was just the fact that no matter what your shape or size is, it's healthy to be getting more vitamin D, to feel the elements on your body, to be in a group where you learn acceptance for your own body and for other people's bodies, independently of what you're saying, independently yeah. of whether you decide that you need to be on a fitness regimen or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, hair and psychologically, sun. emotionally, it has astounding health benefits. Yeah. And so um, my older daughter had to have an operation on her back. And this was, I don't know, some 10 years ago. And um, we went out to the naturist park afterwards and she, you know, just got sun and air and everything on her, on her body where she had had the operation. It's a kind of cyst that teenagers get called a palladinal or something like that. It's very close to where the end, the bottom of the back, the beginning of the buttocks, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not an area that you would normally have exposed to the sun and to the air, but because we were at the naturist park, she was able to do that. She got a whole afternoon of sun and air. <clears throat> she goes back to the, the post-op with her, to the post-operational um, appointment with her with her pediatric surgeon and the pediatric surgeon said she had never seen anyone recover so quickly wow 
So, so yeah, that, this kind of idea of health, right, of sun and air, it's one of the things that the, the, the naturist founders, right, back in Germany in, in the beginning of the 20th century were, were talking about, just being able to get the sun and the air on your body, right? Yeah, yeah, and then there's the also also the other element. The we have been damaging the ozone layer, and we have to be extra careful when it comes to the exposure of sun. Um, sure. But I still it. think it's it's, it's going to be healthy to have some exposure versus none. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, going back to to the work that you've done in naturism, so. I know that you have several workshops that you've been coordinating to um, work with other artists. Can you tell me a little bit about the intention and the work that you do? Yeah, thanks. Um, so, so there's this group of naturist writers. It's an international group, and we've um, someone had the idea to uh, to produce an anthology of short stories, and um, it's called "Murder in the Nudist Colony." Mm -hmm. the, the word colony being a very deliberate kind of inside joke we know that you know you're not supposed to use the word nudist colony anymore but it's kind of a throwback like a retro feel and so we got 15 writers um and one contributed a story the anthology came out last year it's been a hit um it, it all of the proceeds go directly to doctors without borders and it was such a good experience that we wanted to do another one. So now we're in the process of editing the second one, which is called Romance in the Nudist Colony. And that's gonna come out around Valentine's Day. And some of the same authors are in that one, also some new authors. Uh, and again, all the proceeds go to Doctors Without Borders. We're probably gonna do a third anthology at what, some point. What is that association, I'm sorry? Where, where the uh, Doctors Without Borders, Medicos Sin Fronteras. Mm -hmm. So they, they get all the profits. It's a it's an international. Um, is it like Red Cross or something? Yes, it's like Red Cross. Yeah. Okay, wow. So I, I do see that that one is available here on Amazon. Yeah. Um, they have Kindle versions and paperback versions. Yes, indeed. So yeah, the, like say, the, so the next three books, books three nature's books that you have been contributing to two that you wrote yourself and this one that you collaborated with and a fourth one that will soon soon be published on Nick Valentine's, Valentine's Day, right? Yeah. 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 And I'm also working on another novel that I'm writing by myself. It's called Skinners and it's basically going to be Pirates of the Caribbean naked. <laughs> naked Pirates of the Caribbean. And that's I'm really excited about it. It's, it's really cool. I hope that that's going to come out later this year. How do you like, have you have you ever envisioned how a uh, clothing optional or nude friendly world would look like? Like yeah. all the the cultural aspects, the nuances, the uh, you know, it's just clothing and covering up our body and shaming it is so part of our culture. How would the, how would it look like if that didn't exist? Like, I, I don't think clothing will disappear, definitely. I mean, maybe someone would decide to come out uh, Winnie the Pooh style with a top and no bottom or the other way around or yeah. maybe crazier combinations, but how would you envision a world like that? Well, that's a great question. So like <clears throat> um, some of the other writers, I'm going to maintain a, a site called naturesfiction.org. Um, that's with Paul Walker, who's very prolific. He, he writes in both English and Dutch, and he's got science fiction, which is nature's fiction, and he's got historical fiction, which is nature's fiction. Uh, and the other, the other writer is Robert Longpre. Uh, he's Canadian. He's written a lot about um, how uh, nudity helps one connect with psychologically with the archetypes uh, in the past. Um, but so, so all of us and many other writers besides um, have this this idea that you're saying like you know what would the world look like if if there were no clothes and so for, so writing this novel about the like the naked pirates of the Caribbean it it's in the 17th century <clears throat> and there's a lot of reasons that people would have been not wearing clothes pirates are already like outside the law they don't care they no longer have a nationality you're on the you're on the boat all day long in the tropics you don't need to have clothes on once your skin is accustomed to the sun, right? 
There were people who were escaping from slavery who set up their own communities, who also came from countries in West Africa where clothing was not as necessary, or at least not all the different kinds of clothing that the Europeans had. And then there were the indigenous peoples as well, who, because they live in the tropics, did not see the same need for clothing that the Europeans did. So there was actually a lot of context to work with to start to put together this novel. And it's going to be a lot of fun. It's, it's interesting that you mentioned that um, the last guest that we had was Nick and Hannah from, from Two Naturists on a Boat. Yeah. And they told us that it's pretty big. Well, nudity is pretty big amongst the sailing community. So they've, they've been on the beach for so long and they're, you know, busy taking care of things that need to be taken care of that sometimes clothing is just, you know, it's something that they don't need because especially it's hot and humid. So people are accustomed being to be naked. I wonder if, if some pirates were in fact naked. Yeah, it, it's kind of an easy question. And now, <clears throat> but that's, that's like the tropics, right? So what if we're thinking about, you know, there's so many people who love to read novels about um, London, uh, let's see, late 19th century, fog, you know, Sherlock Holmes, the Jack the Ripper, that kind of stuff. I don't know, I, you know, what would that look like? I don't know, but I'm, not, I'm gonna leave that to somebody else. But because I think some contexts are, are more interesting to think about that than others. And like I say, Paul, Paul Walker has written science fiction about um, planets, you know, he has a series called Mirror Earth where it's, it's like an earth, but no one uses clothes. And what does that mean? And what is that like? It's, uh, that is the question that, that we nature fiction writers have to pose. An interesting question and, and a question that makes you explore different like alternative universes or realities or. Yep. So what is naturesfiction.org? What does it do? Uh, what's the intention behind it? How was it created? Uh, what well, was a collaboration to, um, to help in this case, the three of us who wanted to, you know, have our works out there. And we regularly post to the blog aspect of the site as well about whatever kind of question that comes up about issues of um, writing nature fiction or presenting social nudism in fiction, or, um, you know, what does nature fiction mean? How do we get our ideas? How do we answer the big questions like the one you pose? So it's a, it's a, it's a site that has you know, weekly updates, like I say, but it's also there to provide information about our works. But like I say, like there's, there's just three of us who run that site, but there are many more um, writers out there with their works on Amazon, with their own websites. 15, I think, is the number who've contributed to the murder in the nudist colony anthology. And, um, oh, and you mentioned a workshop. I did run a workshop here at the Naturist Park with another writer. His name is D.H. Jonathan. And he lives in Texas, so that was easy to organize. And we, you know, we had a, a, a productive workshop where we talked about what is it like to, to write about nature's and what does it mean when you're writing, you, you know, you can't, there's no, there's no visual, right? It's all in your head. So, for example, um, to what extent do you describe the physical features of someone's body? To what extent do you need to say, um, how tall they are or how dark the skin is or what color their eyes are, or what their hair is like, you know, to what extent is that necessary? And it, it was a productive discussion. We had a little writing exercise where people were challenged to, to write briefly about a situation where someone is um, naked, but without using the word naked. Yeah, I was going to bring that part up. <laughs> you saw that, huh? Yeah, I thought yeah, it was very was interesting. Yeah, I mean, we said, okay, you can't use the word naked, nude, bare, skyclad, you know, you can't use those words, you have to get your way around it some other way. And, you know, it was clever what people came up with. Um, do you have any idea who consumes your, like, this naturist fiction uh, type of novels? Is it naturist or textiles? Have you ever had someone who discovered naturism through your books? I, I, you know, I, I don't know. I wish that I could know. Um, every once in a while, you know, people will write a review or we'll get some kind of feedback on Twitter or this kind of thing. It tends to be um, mostly people who are already familiar with naturism or have an idea of what naturism is, who would, who would look for nature's fiction in the first place. But that isn't always the case. There are people who, who are new to the idea. And so they get kind of 
familiar with what naturism is through these books. And, and that's kind of cool too, when you think about it, because it's like a podcast. There's no, because there's no visual element to it, mm -hmm. people can think what it's like in their heads before they confront the visual aspect of it, right? Yeah, which is interesting. Um, another thing that I encountered when I started promoting naturism, there was one language barrier because everything was in English, but I also felt like there was a lack of content and there, there there's several podcasts and things like that, like the Naturist Living Show or other examples of, of content that existed. But I think that I noticed that there was a lack of a visual representation um, because a lot of what was out there was abstract. Like they would talk about the experiences, they would talk about everything. And I thought that that was great and it definitely helped me. But I think a lot of people are also visual in the sense that it's easy to tell someone that something isn't. Like for example, when, when we talk about naturism, the focus of naturism isn't to eroticize the body or the interaction, but it's really hard for someone who has never seen an example of something that is not eroticized when it comes to nudity to, to visualize that. And that's, that was part of what I wanted to accomplish with my YouTube channel to give people visual representations of what a nudist event was like or vacation or whatever. Um, that's, but I, yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, that's, that's absolutely important. That's 100% important. And, and even, more than a, even more than a photo, because a photo, someone could say, well, that was staged or Photoshop or something. But you've got like a, a video, people yeah. interact, like, like the videos you've made where people are interacting at a social event, they're playing games, they're in the pool, they're simply um, making a pizza, whatever, <clears throat> but they are not wearing clothes. And so it, it, that really drives the point home for people. And that's, that is incredibly important. Yes, absolutely. But I also feel like the community lacks a lot of cultural elements like novels or like cartoons or like video games or like I don't know, movies or drawings or, you know, I feel like these cultural aspects complement and, and make the community more, I don't know, you cohesive. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that, you know, there's room on all fronts. And what you're saying about novels and comics, I mean, we're there, you know, we're 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 going. And and movies and video games, I think that would be kind of like the next step. Of course, there already are movies there was the famous one that came out act naturally right and um, you know some other ones that are more legit than than other movies that try to like have a scene in a nudist camp but it's all for laughs kind of thing. You know, there, there are legitimate you know naturist movies too i don't know about a video game that would be cool <laughs> well i i've definitely heard interest I've, I've had people reach out to me that are interested in creating video games or things like that but it's something that i know nothing of so I didn't feel like I was suited to help, but I do think that the idea is very interesting to, to I don't know, I think it's, it's part of the evolution of a community. It comes to a point where the community is so big and, and rich of different you know, interests and talents and things like that, that there has to be creation that comes from that. There has to be a culture, a language, a, I don't know, these elements. And I also think that it's interesting for some of these to become more and more mainstream. I think that there's there's this video or something on Netflix, a cartoon or something. I'm not sure what it's called, but they talk about different topics and they have an episode that has to do with naturism or not necessarily naturism, but more like social nudity. Um, and I think that the more the mainstream starts, I don't know, maybe like a movie, a modern movie where I think there was a movie, if I'm not mistaken, a cartoon, Zootopia. I don't know if you, if you watch Zootopia. Yeah. There's a scene where they go into yes. a nudist campground. Like these type of elements, I feel that are going to go a long way to normalize what naturism is. Yeah, I remember that scene and I remember thinking, Wow, that's that's a clever little kind of you know promotion there. 
um, yeah, no, I totally agree. And and but I'm thinking of a movie that came out a couple of years ago with Jennifer Aniston and Alan Alda. I didn't end up seeing it, but there were there were scenes that took place in a naturist park in Georgia. Um, I don't know. I don't know how that was received. I'm thinking of um, there's a Netflix series called Lucifer, and in one of the episodes they go to a, a naturist park in California, and it's just you know it's a brief scene, but it it kind of works as far as giving a presentation of what naturism is like and people getting over there their qualms about doing it, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. And I think that all these cultural elements, like the ones that you're doing on the author side, um, is very important, is very, very important because it's going to allow us to be a more cohesive community, but it's also going to allow people that are getting to know who we are, that we're not, you know, a group of crazy people taking their clothes off, that there's there's a lot of a vast culture that comes um, into it and also f from it. Yeah, I w and you know, you made me think I should, I should give a shout out to uh, kind of a precursor figure who was um, uh, Grace Crowley is an Australian uh, comic artist and the comic called uh, Koala Bears. Have you ever seen that? If you've never seen it, you can check it out. No. Oh, wow. Koala Bears. Um, came out, I want to say, oof, early 2000s. Um, Koala bears from who? Grace? Well, yes. Uh, I believe you can find it using the name Grace Crowley, C-R-O-W-L-E-Y. And um, the strip went on to produce a couple of offshoots. One of them was called um, <clears throat> Loxie and Zoot, I think. Another one was called The Bear Pit. But these comics are terrific because they they have great storylines and they show um, people as they look. They show different body shapes and sizes and types. I don't know if you have any luck. I can send you some kind of a link. I think sure. some of them, some of the comics I think got taken down and migrated to another site, but I'm pretty sure that there are some that are still out there. And yeah, so that was one of the inspirations for me to find out that he was this comic artist, a graphic artist who was doing these comics, uh, web comics with great storylines and, you know, representing people the way that they look and confronting, confronting stereotypes and misconceptions about social nudism. Wow. Yeah, I mean, there, there is there's a community around this. And I, and I think that if I have the opportunity to share a little bit more of what they're doing to help, you know, get the word out, it's going to be great because that's also going to allow people who are becoming part of this community to feel much more attached and integrated. And, you know, I think taking your clothes off and socializing with people is great, but there's other aspects and elements to the community that, provide a lot of substance. Um, I think what you guys do is, is great. So tell, tell us a little bit more about the organizations that you have with the different artists. You, is there something other than naturistfiction.org? Um, well, let's see. I, I don't think so. I think just the individual artists and, and, and writers who have their own pages. Um, you did mention that it'd be a good idea to have an opportunity to invite more of these yes. authors to talk about the work that they're doing. Um, tell us a little bit about that. that work. Yeah. I mean, what I'm also going to do, so you can put up for the, for the edited version, is I'll send you a link to um, a, it's called a Naturist's Library, and it's a list that Paul Walker maintains. Paul is one of the other ones who runs the naturistfiction.org site. I'll send that to you because it's got a great list of, of um, He's got it organized by topic and by fiction and nonfiction, just kind of a, you know, reader's list of, of, of nature's books. And of course, there are a couple of, actually, I think there are about four uh, naturist libraries here in the U.S. I think there are, you know, others around the world, but there are, like, it, like it's Cypress Cove. Is that one of the places you went in Florida? No, I didn't. I mean, I wanted to, but we didn't have time. The Cypress Cove has the, um, I think the, the original one, the American Nudist Research Library. But, but anyway, um, so there are organizations out there to support, you know, the idea of naturism being represented 
in print. Um, and there are some great magazines too, like N Magazine from the Nature Society here in the US, H&E in the UK. There was a terrific one out of Brazil that I don't know if it still exists. Um, there was an online one called Jornal Oyunu, and there was a print one. Um, you know, sometimes the print ones are shorter lived, right? But N Magazine, H&E, and then there's a great one out of uh, Canada, what's it called, Going Naturally, I think, in Australia. And there's, you know, there's a number of great magazines that, that are doing their job too. And then there, you know, there's more and more content online. People like you, people like Nick and Lynn's, um, folks who are producing a lot of um, material and, and asking the hard questions online, right? Yeah, I was thinking this year, I wanna focus on providing value to the community. And I noticed that one of the challenges that we have as a community is to get our content out there because there's so many attempts and so many different platforms. And sometimes it's very easy for those platforms to just wipe out the work that we're doing and it's very hard to rebuild the audience that you have. For example, my channel was taken down with 1.3 million subscribers and I've been active on Twitter for, you know, anywhere from uh, eight months now. And I have eight, I've, I've been able to accumulate about 18,000. So I thought that, you know, how can we solve this? And I think everyone has, has, came to the idea sooner or later that it'd be great to have one massive platform, but I don't see that as something practical. I don't see that as something easy. I don't, I mean, hosting is a nightmare when it comes to large format content, such as video, uh, bandwidth and, and just, it's a nightmare. And then the other thing is getting people to use it. So I thought, you know, what, what could be a solution um, and maybe, maybe focusing on the distribution aspect of it. So I thought of sort of like a newsletter or an email or something. I imagine that people would, you know, subscribe, put in their email and get a weekly uh, like bulletin or something like a weekly email highlighting, you know, the content that was created in different platforms for example, if someone wrote a short story or someone published a book or whatever, referring to the written content, but also if someone posted a video or if someone posted a project or a podcast or whatever, and have something that can, you know, put all this content in one place where people could find it. And then if they decide to click on it, then it would take them to the original source. So in a sense, it would be a way to make the, the finding the content and consuming the content easier. That doesn't require, you know, endless hours of searching different social media platforms, but also it would be a way to protect people's creators audiences. Mm -hmm. Let's say, you know, your website is closed I hope it never happens, but let's say it's closed and the people that followed your website have no idea that you started a new one. If they were subscribed to this newsletter, they would find the new one because we would send it to them, right. that kind of aspect. But I think that the, the finding and curating content aspect of it might be challenging, but maybe if we can build teams of volunteers of people that could do something like that, and and have someone that like every have groups i don't know someone in charge of written content someone in charge of videos someone in charge of podcasts or whatever and then send them all into someone that would you know build the email and send it out to hundreds or thousands or if we're lucky millions of of people that receive this newsletter yeah, that's really cool. I mean, I think it's called a content aggregator. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and there have been lots of those around. I mean, I remember there used to be a guy who ran one called allnudist.com. And basically, yeah, he tried to send out, you know, I think he used a Google search term. And so he would, he would get articles that any given day, anything that had to do with the word nudity or nude or naked or whatever, you know, he put it in the search terms and he would send those out. Um, there are a lot of people who do that on Twitter. They have 
daily papers that come out, right? Where that there's a bunch of different articles called from different sources. Yeah. I think what, I think what you're saying that maybe the, the big difference I'm hearing with what you're saying is two things, sending it to the original source, one, and two, having it be a team effort where you've got yes. a, 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 like a print source curator, a video source curator, a music curator, you know, the different kind of curators that would be contributing to a team. That's yeah. Funny. Yeah, I mean, the, the reason why I think it would be good to send it to the original source is because I don't, I don't think that, I, I feel like there's a lot of efforts to do a lot of things, but sometimes there's, it's like a competition. And I, I think competition is great and I think it's healthy, but what I'd like to do is instead of competing against the platforms that already exist, giving them a little boost. Um, that would be one thing. And the other thing is, since I want it to include so many categories of, of content, it's going to be easier if we have a team that could do this. Like, And I think that the team would work from people who are already doing this, like people who are already consuming the content, um, just having them spend maybe some time each day or once a week to put all that content in one place and send it out to someone that would build the email. And the reason why I feel that it would be good to send it to the original source is because we don't have to worry about, um, you know, writing what it's about or, you know, because I've, I've seen some of these content aggregators and, and they sort of like take the content and put it on their site. Yeah. yeah. But this would be more like a direct link to this is the source you know, if you're interested, go and consume it there. Um, and we don't have to worry about hosting costs and all that. It, it might just be paying for the website and paying for um, a service that will allow you to send emails in a massive scale if it becomes successful. Yeah, it's kind of interesting to hear you say email because people would email. Yeah. 2021 and you're talking about email you know but but on the other hand why not because it's sure the email would allow you to send something that was potentially quite a lot of content links in it right yeah and, and the, the reason why it. i came up with email is because everyone has an email right. it's like in, in order to download or create um profiles and in, in social media and things like that most of them ask for an email so everyone has an email right. um and that's not the case for Facebook or for a Twitter or for a WhatsApp or a Telegram or whatever. We can't say everyone has one of those. Right. Um, and the other thing is that it's very easy to consume an email once a week. Mm -hmm. You just yeah. open it, you scroll through it. And if there's anything that you like, yeah. you click on it. And if there's not, then you don't. Yeah. I get plenty of those emails that come on Sundays or Mondays or whatever day you do it. And right, you just look through and is there something that's interesting to you? If not, whatever, yeah. And, and another advantage would be if you have these, this team of curators who are already kind of uh, immersed in, in naturism and know what naturism is, they'd be able to separate the sheep from the goats, as we say. They would be able to say, this article is not about naturism at all. This is stupid or this is not, this is not what we want. But this other article is, you know, to have that kind of um, discrimination, in, I mean, discrimination in a good way on your team would be helpful. Yeah, and we would definitely have to rely on people who, who have, you know, a specific formation or criteria, or I don't know. I, I don't like the idea of like having an editorial line that would decide you are naturist and you're not naturist, but there, there has to be some quality aspect for people who, who receive these emails to know, maybe there could be like a controversial um, part, like towards yeah. the end where, you know, there's discussions over why not making naturism more erotic or sexy or whatever, you know, just whatever people want to talk about, um, but not making it like the main focus of, of the, the newsletter. The idea is to find quality content that is useful and that could be interesting and wanted to be consumed by the community. Yeah. But I don't know if it, I mean, I don't know if it's going to work. First of all, I, I, I need people that, to be interested in doing this because it's not something that I want to dedicate um, right. all my life to or day to, you know, it's just, 
I want to find a way in order to make it easy and practical. And just if you're already consuming it, then, you know, help us out right. kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, sounds great. Well, let's hope, let's hope it works. Um, so anything else that you want to talk about or mention? Any topic that we, we've missed? Um, I, no, not that I can think of, but you know, thank you again for all of your hard work. It's, it's such a pleasure to see what you've done in, in, in Guadalajara and then, and then you know, nationally and internationally. And, and, uh, I think I get more credit than I deserve. <laughs> I, know, I know you're part of the team and, and um, you know, Andrea as well, right, has been helping a lot with you lately. And, and <clears throat> that's just, you know, you guys are helping lead the way. Uh, and you're not the only ones, but you are no. certainly helping lead the way. I think that that's that's a part of um, some. There, every time something bad happens, there's a lot of good things that come along, and I feel that you know the bad was losing the channel, the bad was the pandemic, the bad was you know, but the good is that because I lost my channel, I was forced to try out a new platform, Twitter, and the way that Twitter works allows a lot of interaction with people. And I think that because of that, I've been able to become closer and work more with the community. Um, I think YouTube was more of a solo uh, attempt. Like I was, I was creating whatever I wanted. I would put it out there. I had a great algorithm that would just massively share it with a huge audience. But Twitter doesn't work that way. And and what I really like about it is that I. I I don't feel like I have to, but it incentivizes me to want to reach out to other people that are doing other things and, and get in contact with them, learn more about them, and maybe in the future work together towards you know, a specific cause. And I think that I'm happy. I'm happy that 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 has been the case. And the other good that came out of this is that Andrea was horrified of being, you know recommended like our videos recommended to her students or her work colleagues because she's a teacher now with twitter being more of a niche community um she doesn't feel as afraid and also since we're home and she doesn't interact in person with her students it's less likely for her to be you know discovered um hopefully someday we we change society to the point where you don't have to hide right <clears throat> yep. But in the meantime, I think a lot of good things have, have come out of this. And I've been focus, focusing my creation process and, and all that towards working together with more members of the community, yeah. like, like you or like other people. So I'm, I'm, very, I'm very thankful for the support, very grateful for the opportunity. I feel like I'm one of the luckiest people in the world <laughs> in the sense that I could do something that I'm passionate about mm -hmm. and that other people are passionate about and that so many people support and make it possible. Yep. Keep it up. Yeah. Thank Adelante. you. Thank you very much. So um, all the, the links to everything that we talked in this conversation are going to be in the description of the video and when I share aspects of this on Twitter and so on, also people can find it, but you guys can find Will at Nude Scribe. That's twitter.com uh, forward slash Nude Scribe. And you can also find uh, his books on Amazon. If you search Will Forrest, you'll find all the books that we talked about. And you can find um, a lot of what he talked about the work that he has with different artists through naturistfiction.org. Specifically, the part that I like is the blog part where they talk about different interesting topics related to naturism. So Will, thank you very much. And thank everyone for watching this video. Thank you, Ekpa.